get into experimental design. I'm not going to necessarily do notes today, but I'm going to explain two concepts of experimental design. Most of you guys have uh, learned a little bit of the scientific method in middle school or in other in previous science classes. Um, today we're going to, and this week we're going to kind of add more to that in terms of being able to look at experiments that are done by other people and determine if they're well done or not. And we're going to focus on two topics right now. I'm going to share my screen. And those two topics are sample size and bias. So I kind of made this little document and I'm going to, uh, during seminar today, I'm going to put the, I'm actually recording right now, um, this little kind of explanation about bias and sample size. So when people do experiments, there's several things you need to focus on when you're doing an experiment. And sometimes on purpose or by unintentionally, uh, the experiment isn't designed well. And today we're gonna focus on bias and sample size. And I kind of just wrote up a, a quick definition in my words of what bias is. Bias is the person conducting the experiment influences the experiment so the outcome he or she wants happens. This can be on purpose or unintentional. Um, for example, some of the greatest uh, scientists in, the, uh, in history, like Charles Darwin and others, uh, came up with a theory of something and they were certain that the theory was correct. And as they were gathering evidence, uh, most times the evidence would support their theory, but every once in a while they got some small bits of evidence or uh, data that might go against it. And oftentimes scientists are more likely to disregard uh, data that doesn't support their outcome, even though they shouldn't. Um, and then only focus on the data that really supports their cause. This can often be intentional, but in some cases it is on purpose. Um, I can tell you, I when I was uh, in college, I had to do an ecology class, and I had to do some uh, field research in a prairie, in prairie, or in the prairie, like grassland area, and uh, I had to do figure out the population of grasshoppers in a particular area. And as I was collecting data, um, I was more likely to record the data that supported my uh, research rather than the data that didn't. And I, I definitely showed some bias on that, but because I was pretty certain I knew what the answer was. And unfortunately, that is a form of bias. Okay, one way to um, make sure an a experiment is truly valid is having a large sample size. Sample size is that experiments should include enough data that random chance doesn't influence the results. Small sample sizes can skew result, results. And we're talking about a good sample size. We're talking in the hundreds or thousands of uh, data points or like tests, if you're doing like some kind of experiment. If you're talking about an experiment that has very few people, like less than 50, you should, you should have uh, in your back of the mind know that this experiment might not be completely valid. It doesn't have a large enough sample size. Under 100 is is also one you should, the red flag should go up where you really should want more than 100. You should have hundreds or thousands of data points. So if you guys could have like your chat re ready, I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of experiments and i can tell you this week we're going to see a lot of these kind of examples they're about one paragraph describing a an experiment and they're all kind of uh formatted in the same way they'll talk about who the scientist is and then what how the that scientist had set up the experiment so today we're just focusing on bias of the scientist and sample size so i'm going to read the first example and then you guys are going to kind of in your chat, tell me if this person might be biased or not, and then we'll do sample size. So let me do the first one. I'll read it. Dr. Brittany Anderson, an economics professor working for Pepsi Cola Company, 
recruited 7,500 people for a study of a new low-calorie cola. Participants were asked to replace their soft drink with a new low-calorie Pepsi Cola for six months. After six months, Dr. Anderson found that 63% of the participants had lost weight. Dr. Anderson determined that the new low-calorie Pepsi Cola was a great weight loss supplement. So first off, do you think Dr. Anderson may be biased? And why? If you could put that in the chat, that would be awesome. Okay, several people were saying that Dr. Anderson might be biased uh, because they work for a cola company and she's getting paid to make sure this low calorie co cola is actually um, may help weight loss or at least find some uh, reasons that it may be. Not only that, and, I'll, and no one mentioned this in their chat, but this she, Dr. Anderson is a has a PhD, she's a doctor, but she's not a medical doctor, or some kind of nutritional doctor. She's an economics professor. So should she really be uh, doing medical studies on weight loss? Is that her field of study, really? Um, more than likely, Pepsi Cola just asked someone with a doctorate to see if they could come up with uh, some data to prove that their soda was a diet soda. Okay, next question. Do you think 7,500 people for a study is a large or small sample size? Definitely. Some of you guys are putting large sample size. 7,000 is a good study. We're not going to focus on like the percentages yet. We're just focusing on if she's biased and if, this, if the sample size is large enough. We'll talk about the way it's designed later in the week. But I would say 1,000 is a large study and it's probably going to be, um, if the experiment's set up right, 7,000 people should give you uh, a good sample size. However, she is likely biased because she's not necessarily a medical doctor uh, with any expertise in weight loss, and she's getting paid by uh, the uh, Pepsi company to do that. Now, does that mean that if you uh, work for a company to, to uh, figure out a product that, that you're, you're definitely biased? No. Um, if you're a scientist that works for like a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company and are trying to uh, determine new medicines, you might or might not be biased depending on uh, how you set up the experiment. If you have other people, uh, you come up with the medication, then have hospitals that aren't associated with your company do the studies, and you, that's definitely not biased. However, if you're doing all the experiments only in your laboratory, there might be. Okay, let's go to the second example. Dr. Calvin Wilson is a scientist at Harvard, has a promising new drug that seems to slow the grain of hair. Dr. Wilson recruited 30 people with grain hair to participate in a study to test the effectiveness of this new drug. After six months of taking the new drug, 77% of the participants did not have increased hair grain. Um, let's just again focus on the doctor himself and the sample size. The fact that he's only testing grain in six months is probably not a good design, right? Six months is not very long for hair grain. Trust me, I can attest to that. Um, do you think that Dr. Wilson is it has any bias in this? Probably not. Uh, a lot of companies will send new drugs to universities to uh, test it. So there is a bias. 
like a lot of pharmaceutical companies will send uh, drugs to uh, universities and their hospitals to test it. So I don't think he necessarily has is biased. However, is the people a large enough sample size, do you think? Probably not. 30 people is way, way too low. If you're having uh, a experiments in the double digits, that's a big red flag. It should definitely be in the hundreds and hopefully in the thousands for a good study. Um, if it's below 100, it's you could run into uh, sample size issues. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing for just a second. I'll, I got a, I'm recording this and I'm, we're done with this at least. And I'm gonna re-share my screen.